Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, my name is Vincent Mayers. Uh, I am the director of, of community at, uh, at Gradle. But I'm not a software engineer, and I'll get to that in a bit. But I, I do play one on TV, uh, and I run the Atlanta Java users group. And all this will kind of be relevant uh, in a bit. So what is this about? Um, it comes from this book uh, by Greg Mortensen and, and David Rain called Three Cups of Tea. Now, Greg Mortensen was a, uh, was a, a mountaineer um, and was climbing in the Himalayas and fell and was injured and was nursed back to, to health by some people in a local village. And he was in this village for some months. And while he was there, he noticed that there were some kids outside in, a, in the dirt drawing stuff on the floor. And he said, what, what's this? And they said, this is their school. And he was so moved by this that, and, and the hospitality of this village that he decided that he wanted to build schools uh, in, in the Himalayas or in the uh, Hindu Kush. And he realized that uh, before he could do this, um, he had to actually build a bridge over the river to get stuff to, uh, to build the school. So this all sparked a, a, uh, a nonprofit that he created, <coughs> which over the years had built, um, focused on building schools for girls in Afghanistan. Um, with the help of, dur during the Afghan war, and also in collaboration with, with the Taliban leaders at the time, and he had, a, um, he had a, a, a license to do this from them. And this book, Three Cups of Tea, was actually required reading by military commanders uh, in the region for a while because it gave such an insight into the, uh, uh, into the culture of the region. Now, there's been some controversy over Greg, um, some of his backstory, <coughs> and... Um, that he's defrauded uh, donors to this nonprofit, but the sentiment um, is uh, remains of, uh, and the spirit kind of remains. So, in Balti, which is this tribe, or Pashtun, which is the region culture, the first time you share tea with someone you're a stranger, the second time you take tea with them and you're a friend, a guest, and the third time you share a cup of tea, you become family. Okay, and this sentiment has has not changed um, despite the controversy of the book. Now, we got to the third time, so let's talk about the importance of the number three. Okay? Um, three is, uh, 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 over history, is a very, very important number uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. We'll, we'll dig into some of that and it will become relevant as to why soon. So, in religion, for example, <coughs> in Christianity, uh, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? There are also uh, if you, uh, the three crosses on, on the mount when Jesus was crucified. Uh, in Buddhism, you have the Buddha, uh, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Uh, Buddha being the, the God, Dharma being the doctrine, and, and the Sangha, um, Sangha being the, the, the order or the community, actually. Um, in Hinduism, you have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma, the creator, uh, Vishnu, the preserver, and uh, Shiva, the destroyer. In mythology, you have... In Norse mythology, you have Nibelheim, um, which is the land of mist. You have Muspelheim, which is the land of fire, and uh, I can never pronounce this, which is the part in between them. Right? You guys can pronounce that. <laughs> in Greek mythology, you have you have Zeus, you have Poseidon, and Hades as the three main characters. Uh, and in uh, in Egyptian mythology, you have Osiris, Isis, and Horus. In literature, Aladdin had three wishes. There were three bears. There were three elven rings, okay? Um, in science, observable matter is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now, I know that there are other forms of the matter, but in the other verses, right, in our verse, it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, okay? Uh, in biology, there are three, three nucleoids, or condons, which, are, which determine the um, uh, genetic code of, of, of all living things. Um, and... Uh, the perception of color relies on three types of cone cell in, in the retina. And interestingly, those cone cells are divided into three types, uh, short range, medium range, and long range, which are also three different colors, red, blue, and green, which are the three primary colors. All right, so I get it. Three is important, but what does this have to do with community? So <coughs> let's revisit um, this quote for a second. 
uh, you know, the first time you share tea with, a, uh, with someone, you're a stranger. The second time you take tea, you're an honored guest. The third time you share a cup of tea, you become family. Okay, so let's take a look at community and see where this starts to tie in. Now, in early communities, up until about 10,000 BC, um, primitive communities relied on, there were three main drivers, the need for shelter, the need for food, the need, the need for security. We fast forward a little bit and we, become, we get into Neolithic communities uh, where the drivers are now agriculture. We started to domesticate animals. There started to be more stability in, in, uh, uh, in settlements and, and communities and, and culture, uh, communities started to, to evolve in a more stable way. Okay? Uh, in the classical era, around 500 BC, in Grecian uh, or in Greece, we start to see the seeds of democracy, um, this, the rise of city-states, uh, and the uh, the emergence of civic duty, doing things for other people. Okay, um, the Han Dynasty in China, around about the same time, saw uh, advances in global trade. Uh, the Han, uh, during the Han Dynasty, the Silk Road was established, which was a major trading route from uh, from the um, the east to the west. Okay. Uh, we saw advanc advances in technology. Uh, the size, the, f the earliest seismometer uh, uh, that we know of was found in, in to was dated back to China uh, in this time, uh, as was the wheelbarrow. Okay, paper was also invented in uh, in in the Han Dynasty in China, and we saw advances in art porcelain as we know it today. The first instances of porcelain um, ceramics in the world uh, uh, are attributed to the Han Dynasty. So getting into medieval and early modern times, you know, around about 500 AD, about 1,000 years later, uh, in Europe, we see uh, the emergence of feudalism and manneralism and, and religion as a primary driver. So uh, manneralism is basically this concept of the lord of the manor, uh, the baron, the earl, uh, and uh, the earl or the baron had, uh, had knights that served him, the knights had uh, peasants or serfs that serve them. It's basically a whole racket, okay? Just like the mafia. Um, but this, uh, this kind of concept of my castle, my people, gave rise to feudalism. And um, there was a lot of warring going on at the time, a lot of jockeying for power and position and land. Uh, and all this was driven by, uh, or, or um, yeah, driven by, by, by religion. Not driven by religion, but it was underlined by religion and religious beliefs. Early modern times, <coughs> around about the, uh, I mean, I'd call it the Industrial Revolution. It's basically this 200 year period from 17 whatever to 18 something. So this uh, saw the rise of, of nation states, okay, um, that were fueled by colonialism and, and industry. The, our ability to create these ships uh, and, and this technology to do that, that, that allowed us to travel around the world and take goods from one part to another part and sell them for profit gave rise to these, these nation states and people moving and allowed people to move to other parts of the world uh, and uh, and gave you know further growth to industry. Now um, what if okay in fifteen in the fifteenth century there was uh, an Admiral uh, Zheng He uh, in China that built ships that were 140 meters long. Okay? History records these as having traveled uh, west from China to the coast of Africa. Uh, so I'm just asking you to think, what if these ships had actually gone around uh, the Cape uh, and carried on up uh, uh, across the Atlantic or up into Northern Europe? What would our world look like today? Uh, given that we know, what's, uh, you know how trade influenced our times from the 1800s with European settlements, what do you think would, it would look like today if, if the Chinese had managed to sail around the Cape and, and trade with Northern Europe basically 500 years before that? Anyway, uh, so contemporary, our time. Is that me? My microphone is off. Why is that? Does anyone have an iPhone where it randomly starts playing music? <laughs> Does that happen to anybody? Yeah. Oh, why? Anyway. <laughs> um, so contemporary times, where we are now. Um, now we see uh, the rise of, uh, of, of suburbia, uh, which is fueled by advances in technology, the, the, uh, and transport, cars, trains, 
whatever, it means that people do not now need to live close to where they work if they work in, in industry. Now, a, you know, agriculture is different. But if they work in, in, in an industry, they don't need to, uh, to live, where, live where they work. So we see this suburban sprawl. And this also has given uh, rise to, to more diversity uh, with, with people as they're allowed to, to move more easily from one part of the world to another. And then we also see the rise of, of online uh, communities with the advent of, again, through technology, with the advent of the, uh, the interwebs. And um, <coughs> the primary drivers are shared interests and, and communication. And, and, and there's rules and norms okay, that, 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 that come with that, uh, this, this online community. So let's go back to, uh, to this uh, you know, primitive society where the drivers were food, shelter, and security, uh, and kind of try and map it to today. All right, so take an intellectual leap with me here, if you will. So, you know, shelter to shared interests, food. Well, we all, not all of us, but there's food now. Um, and people now crave that, crave communication. They crave likes. They crave that dopamine hit from people engaging with them on, online. Uh, and security, uh, now it equates to, to rules and norms, okay? Uh, the, the need for security online and, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, what's changed in the last 10,000 years, okay? I don't think anything's changed. We just, this person in a cave with a computer, all right? Um, so revisiting this, security equals rules and norms, okay? Because this is important. So these days, our rules and norms for online communities and offline communities are the need for inclusivity uh, and the need for things like codes of conduct like, like we have here at, uh, at JCon. <coughs> and, you know, we gather uh, into these groups and we have shared interests as well, and it, it you know, we, we become, start to become a community. However, sometimes this inclusivity can also be selectively exclusive. So um, you have this group of multicolored people here that are all into the same thing and, uh, and walking in the same direction and have shared interests, but, oops, wrong way, um, but then all of a sudden all the green folks get together. Uh, and even though you're part of this community, if you're not green, you start to feel excluded within your community. All right. So we've got to be careful about this when we, you know, when we think about uh, inclusion uh, and communities. There's a uh, there's a great song by Peter Gabriel. Anyone anyone know who Peter Gabriel is? Or I'm just showing my age. Right. Okay. Well, this is a 1980 album. P uh, it's a live album, imaginatively titled "Plays Live," and there's a song on this called Not One of Us. And in the intro to this song, Peter says, uh, this is a song about groups of people that make themselves into smaller groups in order to feel strong but excluding others. And I remember hearing this in 1980, I guess, um, and it's, it's, it's always stayed with me and it's very relevant to the, the point I, I just made. So, um, you know, we're social animals, okay? Uh, we need human in interaction. Uh, it's important for our physical health, you know, our mental health, our, our longevity, function, uh, emotion, and for emotional support, and uh, just development generally. And uh, <coughs> some of that's going away as, uh, you know, because of events of recent years as we start to move more and more online driven by you know, uh, the, the kind of global health crisis we've just had. In fact, Gartner says that by um, 2024, less than 24% of all meetings uh, will be in person. And to me, that's staggering because I'm an in-person person, person <laughs> right? Uh, they've also done studies to show that, that employees crave value and purpose in their workspace and their work above all else. And that uh, our, our mental health as a society uh, has been um, you know, challenged. Uh, by, uh, by the global pandemic and by the public health crisis we've just had, okay? So, um, raise of hands, who, who's, is their first conference or the first one they've been to since the pandemic? A few people, okay, good. Uh, you're here, uh, so you're an outlier, right? Just think of that for a second. All right, human interaction is, is vital, okay? Um, and if your work envir environment doesn't provide this, you, you really have to find a way to seek it out for yourself. But how do we do this? And how do we do this in the context of us being kind of nerdy, geeky type people? Um, there are a number of ways, okay? 
provinces, tech groups, and, 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 and your teams. And we'll get to your teams part because it's a little bit counterintuitive if you're remote or hybrid. So in conferences, okay, what are the three main elements that we look for? Okay, there's learning, there's social interaction, and there's motivation, all right? So with learning, one of the great things about being in person at an event over seeing the same content, if you will, uh, even sometimes even from the same speakers online, is, this, is a singular focus, okay? You are away from your normal day-to-day. -day. All right, who, who's been checking email in, in, in the set? Who's checked email since the start of this talk? <laughs> oh, come on. I don't blame you. I do the same things, <laughs> all right? However, um, the ability to, to have a singular focus while you are at an event like this is, is huge. Okay, free from the distractions, free from having to context switch all the time, which other people have talked about earlier this week. Um, learning new skills, okay? Sometimes one of the coolest things about a conference is um, when there's a session that you really want to go to on DevOps or whatever, or Spring Boot, and it's full. There's, there's no room there, okay? So what else is on the schedule? Uh, well, I'm going to go to this one on Node.js. Oh, really? Okay, you're a back-end Java developer or work on microservices? Yes, go to the Node.js uh, uh, session. Go to the, um, the web, Webpack session, whatever. Go to the, eight, the CSS. All right, who likes CSS? Anybody work with CSS? Who likes it? There you go. Go to the CSS session, <laughs> all right? Uh, it's important to learn new things. Uh, you might not use these in your day job, okay? But uh, they may start you thinking in different ways that help you in your day job. And then insights, again, uh, in talking to other people and just hearing how even, uh, you may even be an expert in your subject, but hearing how somebody else who not, might not necessarily be an expert, but just a passionate community member talks about this, might even give you more insights into, into what you do. All right. Um, so the social part, uh, the networking, okay, that's a given. We all network, we all have fun, um, we all collaborate, and we all build new relationships. But here is, 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 how, is why this is important, okay? Uh, who's heard of the hallway track? Okay, a few people. So uh, the hallway track um, is, is, the, is the sessions between the sessions, okay? It's the social interaction that you have with other conference goers over lunch, uh, over coffee, walking from A to B, afterwards in the bar. We call it the hallway track because <coughs> um, it happens in hallways. All right. Uh, but the reason this is important is uh, you could be chatting to somebody that you randomly met for the first time uh, at a lunchtime or a break or a coffee, and you know, your real-world use case for something you're working on comes up, and you start to describe your problem, and the person that you're speaking to may or may not have solved this, okay? But they have a, a perspective on it, which you have ha never had. And that perspective can totally change how you think about it, and that could totally change your life, okay? In a way that learning about the newest you know, thing in Spring Boot 3 cannot, okay? It, to me, is the most important part of being at an event with like-minded people who are motivated enough to be here with you, okay? Oh, I just talked about motivation. <laughs> But what does it actually do? Um, it, it, uh, for me, being in an event like this, uh, and uh, I'm an artist at heart, and you'll see why later, but being in a room full of like-minded people talking about uh, things that I am passionate about really fuels my creativity. Okay, it gets me thinking in new ways. Uh, I spent a lot of time with artists, uh, and the reason why artists actually gather in a conium is because everyone feeds off their creative energy. Okay, you're all now feeding off your nerd energy, all right? So it's the same kind of thing. And this helps to renew your purpose in what you're doing uh, and, and, and give you back developer joy, all right? Which we've also talked about. Um, there are various ways that you can engage with, with uh, tech groups, okay? In, in cities where you live or in the countries you're in. So, <coughs> okay, meetup.com, uh, all right. Is, uh, is meetup.com really popular in, in, uh, in Europe? Or is it just in the US? Yes or no? Show of hands. Okay, so it's, it's kind of become the default web presence these days for groups to, to advertise what they're doing and engage people to come and, and join them, all right? So 
for the Java space, the meetup stats say that there are, in the world, there are 1,300, over 1,300 groups that are connected to the Java ecosystem uh, in f over 470 cities and in over 80 countries. That's powerful, okay? Uh, and if you've never been to your local Java user group, uh, Emily, uh, who's in the next room, <laughs> go, okay? Um, I went back. So, uh, JUGS, Java Users Groups, uh, Fuji.io. Who's heard of Fuji? Fuji.io. Okay, the folks that haven't, uh, Fuji stands for Friends of Open JDK. Okay, it is a community effort to uh, distribute, uh, uh, to, uh, basically to educate, to educate the community on content connected to the Open JDK ecosystem. Right, Fuji, uh, F O O J, just. Fuji, right, however you think you should spell it, type that into Google, it'll come up, right? Uh, so these stats are from Fuji. There are over uh, 230 listed Java user groups in over 200 countries and over 60 countries. There's most likely one in driving distance from your house, all right? Hackathons, who's ever been to a hackathon? Okay, Other, another thing to try. So the great thing about hackathons is um, it's almost like what I talked about when you can't get into the Spring Boot 3 session, so you go to the Webpack session, all right? You get to learn new things uh, and share uh, things you know with others and then collaborate with them to build something. This, is, um, this one is called 48 and 48. It's in my <coughs> hometown of Atlanta, USA. I, I'm actually not from the USA. You might can tell from my accent, but I've lived there for, for 20 years. Uh, 48 and 48's mission is to build 48 websites, 48 nonprofits in 48 hours. So they came up with this really imaginative name, 48 in 48. I think it's great. <coughs> and uh, about 200 people gather in a in a workspace uh, for basically two days. And uh, they you know they a lot of them sleep there. They they bring food in and then and then create. They start from scratch. They start from scratch uh, with the with the uh, with the wireframes. Okay, <coughs> and they and they knock out 48 websites in in 48 hours. It's a phenomenal thing to be involved in. Again, being around like-minded people with a singular purpose uh, fuels your creativity and renews your purpose, all right? Uh, this is a hackathon uh, in, from the Guinness Book of Records, the largest one ever in the world, uh, in Russia in 2019. There were over 3,200 people involved in this hackathon over a weekend, um, which to me is pretty amazing. All right, so your team, all right? This is a little bit counterintuitive part because uh, all right, who is 100% back in the office? Excellent, nobody, this is my point, all right? Who works uh, hybrid, hybrid model? Some days back in the office, some days not, okay? And then who works fully remote? And the rest of you don't work at all. I love you, I wish I could be you, <laughs> all right? But what can you do here, all right? In your town, if you, okay, if, you, if you live in a major metro area, there is most likely somebody from your company, most likely, there's possibly somebody from your company that lives in the same town, okay? They don't necessarily need to work in technology, all right? And of course, there are ways to find out who lives in your town. Ask them out to lunch. They're hybrid too. They're remote too. They're feeling the same kind of isolations that some, that some of us feel as well. They may not work as a dev. They, they may work in accounting. It doesn't matter. You know what? Have a local meeting with them. Go work out of a coffee shop. Go to lunch. Go for drinks. You don't have to do this every week, but do it occasionally. Why not? What have you got to lose? You will both get a, uh, you know, a sense of accomplishment out of this. Um, lunch and learns. This is something that's interesting. If you, if you work hybrid or you are back in the office, um, and you will obviously, or you may possibly have a lunch break, have a speaker over that lunch break. Whoa, this stage is not as big as I thought. <laughs> uh, a local speaker, um, it could be somebody from your community, from a Java user group, from, a, uh, from the Node.js or the Webpack meetup, who knows, okay? Have them come in and present what they do. What else are you gonna do? Sit there and eat a sandwich and stare at each other? Do this, all right? Uh, bring in an expert from the community. You know, we are part of a larger Java community. There are plenty of experts around. Uh, there are people. There could be people visiting your city. Uh, how do you find this out? You can. There's. Just, just pay attention. Okay, Twitter, LinkedIn, blah blah blah. Um, there might be an expert in something visiting your city that week. Invite them in. 
and then vendors as well. So <coughs> all of us that work in large software companies uh, buy stuff from other software companies, or even if you work in a small software company, you are going to be buying some kind of service, okay? Uh, invite them in to talk to you, because I guarantee you, if you're, if you're using a service that you pay for, uh, and you think you're an expert in that thing, you are not, okay? They're gonna probably going to be able to show you something, another switch you can flip on, another, another dial you can turn, uh, which you weren't necessarily aware of, okay, that can make your life easier. And then I it's about you, all right? You've got to take personal responsibility for doing this. No one else is going to do this for you, okay? It has to start with and come, and come from you. So um, none of this, none of this, is possible without consistency, all right? Now, the software engineering term that we l all know is eventual consistency, okay? Uh, and this is from Cilia DB, and, and it, I'll just read it. An update will eventually be reflected in, in all nodes that store data resulting in the same response every time the data is queried, okay? Makes sense, right? And there's all kinds of really boring diagrams that, that, that allude to this, like there's no A this and or what's, what's an or set? I don't know. Or set that. Boring. Okay. And this is the one I like better. Okay. This is from XKCD. Uh, and it says, that, hey, this is the computer. <coughs> hey, I know it's hard. Uh, hard to focus right now, but we, you know, we should try testing the database. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the system needs to guarantee eventual consistency. Uh, I mean, I guess it does. Eventual consistency guarantee is guaranteed by the second law of thermodynamics. Sooner or later, uh, this will all be a uniform heat bath, guaranteeing maximum entropy. Computer. Maximum entropy means no useful work will be done. Okay, I'm getting a head start by doing no useful work now. All right? So... There are problems with these two examples that I've just given you. The first one is, well, eventually. Okay? The second one is, sooner or later. All right? This is not good enough. Okay? <laughs> to accomplish anything, uh, and we are talking in terms of uh, you know, being involved in tech communities, but this really applies to anything in life. Okay? You have to have intentional consistency. Okay? And the thing about intentional consistency is it's really, really hard, okay? Um, and the only way it ever happens is if you take personal responsibility for it, okay? Now, let me give you some examples uh, here. So in athletics, okay, we all understand what athletes do. They train super hard. They condition really hard. They, they have to do mental preparation uh, for... Um, you know, for, for both training and competitions, athletes before their event mentally rehearse uh, their race, their jump, uh, whether they're trying to go further or faster or higher. They, 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 they actually run a clock, some of them, um, and they mentally rehearse that, they time it, and they see if that time e equates the expected time for them over a course, all right? Um, with work, this is an example from the Atlanta Java user group uh, that I've been involved with for many years. It was a, a meetup in 2019. Quarkus came out in 2019, okay? And Bruce Sutter from Red Hat uh, came into Atlanta to do this talk on, uh, on Quarkus, all right? The reason I put this up is because there was a lady <coughs> that had come to the Java user group for a long time, um, and she was at this meetup. And she told me many months later that a few months after the meetup, she was at a job interview, okay? And um, Quarkus was not part of the stack that she was interviewing for, okay? But the interviewer asked her if she had any experience with it because they were thinking of using this in their stack at a later date. And, and this is a story she relates to me. She said, no, I haven't used it. However, I was at a Java user group meeting a few months ago, and this dude from Red Hat came and talked about Caucus, and it's cool. I think it's cool for this reason, for that reason, for another reason. It solves this problem, whatever. She got the job because of that comment. Okay? Now, can you guarantee this every time? I'll tell you what, I'll guarantee you, if you don't do it, it won't happen. All right? 
And then, um, who, who has kids in the room? Okay. Especially with children. Being intentionally consistent is super hard. Okay. Getting them into, into I, at least I find it super hard. Uh, getting them into good habits and, and with the right boundaries, the support is a given. Um, but it's extremely challenging. But in I, my, understand, my perspective is that in raising children is vital. That, they, that you create these boundaries and habits because children lo- need structure. They, it's not they love it, they need structure. Okay, they really do. All right, so remember this dude? Okay, I'm not a software engineer, but I play one on TV. All right, I've got a degree in pottery. All right, four years at art school doing this. Okay, how the hell did I get here? So I was this athlete, okay? This is me in, in 1993 at the World Championships in Italy. So I've lived this life of having to be super intentional about how I got to that point, about all the physical and mental preparation and all the other operational things, because there's a lot that goes into getting to that start line where you, 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 know, you get to do this, all right? In the workplace. Again, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I have a degree in pottery. I used to be a tech recruiter, okay? But that meant that I got to learn a lot about tech. And I learned early on that um, it was very important. All right, who's dealt with recruiters in this room? Okay, who thinks they know what they're talking about? Uh, That's a really disappointing show of hands. Why? Because recruiters are actually very important. Okay, they're important if you're hiring people and if you're trying to get hired. But they usually don't know enough about what they're talking about. I realized this very early on when I was in London and uh, we, we built a practice to send software engineers into the banking sector. And uh, in this is kind of pre-Java. Uh, well, r- this is around 97, so Java is just coming out. But the enterprise stack of the day for banking uh, specifically was C++, Sybase, and Power Builder. Okay, that's, that was, broadly speaking, um, what these highly secure, highly available banking apps are written in, um, with you know, messaging thrown in there somewhere. So I remember being at my sales pitch Okay, <coughs> and I, I was, it was a new client, it was a bank. I said, well, I'd love to help you. You know, we can provide all these engineers. I know C++, I know Sybase, I know Corber. He was like, stop, what's Corber? Because this is like one of the questions that he would ask, you know, to figure out if anyone's paying attention. And I was like, well, it's common object broker architecture. And the tool that everyone uses right now is Orbix by Ionor out of Dublin. And he, had absolutely, he was absolutely blown away that I knew this, okay? But why did I know this? I wanted to be intentional about understanding all these terms, okay, and what they were, and what, where they fit in a tech stack and what they did, and who made them, right? So <coughs> fast forward a number of years, and I, I'm in Atlanta. Uh, I'd moved there to start a, 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 a recruiting business with some friends. Around 2004, you know, J2E was blowing up, all right? It was J2E and, and, and uh, you know, JSPs and Struts and Struts 2. Struts. Struts 2. <coughs> Uh, and all the clients wanted this. So I started to sponsor the Java user group, okay? Because I, um, a number of reasons. I wanted to learn more. Uh, I, u- I would have conversations with engineers all day long, but it's easier and better in person, right? Uh, I wanted to learn more. Uh, I wanted to, to be part of the ecosystem in the community. I wanted to meet potential consultants that I could send to clients. I wanted to meet potential clients, right? Win-win. So I started to sponsor the Java user group, my, well, my company did. And I just stayed involved over the years, uh, even when I wasn't a recruiter. Um, <coughs> and around 2008, uh, the guy that was running the Java user group left and said, "Can you join? You know, do you want to join the board? Why? Because I was always there. Right? I was there like uh, you know the, the third Tuesday of every month is when you meet. Uh, initially, it was like uh, around 2004, five. None of this PowerPoint stuff. IDE, live coding and debugging. That was it for like two hours." Okay, no presentations are about anything with Venn diagrams or, or, or diagrams, right? Hardcore, live coding, debugging on an IDE um, or on a command line. <coughs> so there I was initially uh, trying not to fall asleep at the back of the room. You know, a long day for me, I'm a recruiter. Oh, look, the recruiter's asleep in the back of the room. Haha. <laughs> I didn't want to be that person, okay? So, but it was hard. But I stayed involved, and, I, and, I, and, I, and over time, I understood more about what people were talking about, it, the, the pieces... Of, you know, they made more sense, okay? Uh, so I got asked to join the board in 2008, uh, and then um, we, uh, we, um, the JUG runs the DevNexus conference in Atlanta, and in 2008, I became the default organizer uh, for that. 
okay? So, I mean, I've never run a conference before. How do you do that? Figure it out, okay? Figure it out. <coughs> but um, what that's led me to in, in, in my career is then I became a wider part of this Java ecosystem, okay? I started to meet people from all over the world that came to our event. Uh, luminaries, speakers, published authors, language and framework creators. Uh, I used to travel to other events to see how they were run so I could learn how to make our event better, okay? So my horizons broadened as did my network, okay? And over time, I, after some time, I got nominated to be a Java champion, actually 10 years ago, 2013. How, how does a, a person with a degree in pottery become a Java champion? It's like, why? But the group recognized that the Java champions group is not about being a technical luminary in Java, not just. It's about contributions to the community. And those can be technical or non-technical, okay? Um, but that's opened other doors for me as well. And, and now I'm also a steering committee member for MicroProfile. I've got a degree in pottery, really? How do you, get all, how do, you do that? Like, it doesn't make, even make sense. By being intentionally consistent ab about, about what I'm doing, all right? And then, you know, with kids. Okay, these are my kids. Uh, both my children um, uh, are hard work. <laughs> Okay, and I find it, uh, and my wife does too, um, it's just very, very hard, okay, uh, to be, uh, to, to create and enforce the habits and boundaries because life gets in the way, okay, and you're always exhausted. I wouldn't change it for the world. But uh, I'm trying to illustrate that I've lived the three points. So what has this got to do with cups of tea, right? It doesn't make sense. So um, let me talk about the bakery scenario. Right? Sounds like a line from a Quentin Tarantino movie. The bakery scenario. Some years ago, um, I was in New York. Uh, and before I get into that, le let's revisit this quote, okay? The first time you share tea, you're a stranger. The second time you take tea, you're not a guest. The third time you share a cup of tea, you become family. So, uh, and of course, cat pictures, all right? Um, uh, I was backpacking, uh, traveling, and I was in New York, and uh, no money, and I'm staying in a youth hostel, and underneath the youth ho hostel was a bakery, okay? So the first morning there, going to the bakery, I'll have a cup of tea, and a, and a, and a donut or something. Okay, here you go. Thank you. The second morning, hey, nice to see you again. I'll have a cup of tea. And a donut. Oh, excellent. How was your day yesterday? Blah, blah, blah. Great, thanks. The third day. Oh, welcome back. I, I just made some fresh baklava. Would you like to try this? Come on in, come on in. Do you want another cup of tea? Have two donuts. One's on the house. All right. Every single interaction, for the most part, that you will have with someone, uh, someone new that you meet, that you meet again and again, goes this way. Okay? Especially in the context of our Java community, which to me, because I'm involved in other communities, is, 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 is one of the most welcoming ones that I know, okay? For, for reasons I, I, it's just welcoming, okay? But the interactions usually go this way. The first time that you meet someone, uh, cu it's because you're introduced by someone else. It's, oh, hi, hi, okay? Oh, the sec I need to go to remote classes. Okay, the second time you meet that person, it's hi, how are you? Good to see you again. Okay, and then the third time's ah, all right. Think about this in the context of your lives and see if it resonates with you. Uh, I think it's especially uh, evident in in these types of co our community and other types of communities because we all have shared interests. Okay, we are all outliers because we're at this thing, which is not a normal thing for people to do especially these days after, after the ch habits changed during the pandemic. But these interactions go this way. Hi, like hi handshake, hug. Again, think about it in the, in the frame of references of your own lives. Has it ever happened this way? It, it, it doesn't happen, you can't force this in like a day or in a number of minutes. It has to happen organically over, it could be three days, it could be three years, all right? But it does happen. Just think about it in, 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 in the context of your lives. So. Wrapping this up with community, for me, and you know, the, the three most important elements, or what I get most out of it, is this sense of belonging. I'm not an engineer, but I do feel welcome. Okay, I do feel included. Um, the ability to collaborate. Uh, I'm very fortunate to, to have met a lot of the speakers at, at, at these events uh, over the years, and they've become 
great friends of mine, okay? Uh, and I love hanging out with them. And we start to work on stuff, we work on stuff together, even if it's just building Legos, right? Um, and then giving back, okay? As, a, as an event organizer, or as a jug organizer, uh, or as anyone in the community, you can, you can do stuff for others. As an event organizer, we give out, we give out passes to, to nonprofits and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, as a person, I, I'm actually uh, on a couple of nonprofit boards uh, because I know that if I gave a dollar or a euro to everyone that needed a euro, I'd be right with them needing a euro, all right? But I can give back some of my time, right? Um, so for me, these three things are, are the most important things about uh, being involved in, in any community, a, a book club, a chess club, your church, if, if, if you do that, or in, in our context, these tech events, all right? And, you know, three cups of tea or something else. Okay, this is usually how it goes with us. So, um, I'd love to connect with you. Okay, you can reach me on. A, I'm not a huge Twitter person, but I'm on Twitter. Uh, this is my email, uh, or you can reach me on LinkedIn if you like. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for for not falling asleep during the talk.